From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. So, uh, friends, Romans, countrymen, comrades... Uh, we're here today. We have a special guest, my friend Joy Pryor, a Grand Rapids resident, but she's from Hamtramck. Am I right? Highland Park. Highland Park. Oh, good grief. See, now I know it's a thing when you confuse Hamtramck with Highland Park because <laughs> they're not. Yeah, the they sort of joined place. at the hip, literally. Literally, yeah. Uh, but quite different. Quite different, different places. I think, is it? Is it Hamtramck or Highland Park that is it's is a separate municipality inside both, of both of them are. Oh, there's okay. And they have their their own uh infrastructure and yes. municipal uh budgets and things that are separate and distinct from Detroit. But I think they're both surrounded entirely by Detroit. Yes, that's correct. I see. And what's tell me a little bit about the history of that. Like what where did that come from? I, I'm not entirely certain, but mm-hmm. uh, as many large met- metropolitan areas, it grew by incorporating unincorporated areas around it. Um, I think what I heard about Highland Park, well, um, Henry Ford, the Model T plant was yeah. there, and it benefited the powers that be to control the municipality that they were oh, right in. Right, right. So they declined incorporation. I see. And Detroit just expanded around them. Correct. Oh, sort of like a company town thing, really. Mm-hmm. S- somewhat. Somewhat, yeah. Oh, yeah. people think of Dearborn more as being Ford because Ford's la- later Ford. when they built the Rouge plant, mm-hmm. so much was there. And to give people that have a little sense of Detroit from the M&M movie that was named Eight Mile. Yeah. So Eight Mile being the dividing line between Detroit and Oakland and Macomb counties. Yeah. Um, Highland Park is south of Six Mile. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really quite central. It's right. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. So forgive me for confusing the two. Um, but I had the unique opportunity of having you here on a Sunday, we're recording, and I've long wanted to talk with you about the First Stop Shop, and um, it's an amazing project, and my big regret was that we weren't in the same place to do it, (laughs) which is the thing that keeps coming up, right? Yeah. Great projects and not enough sort of um, critical mass to get the ball rolling in a place. Well, it's been my great regret since I met you, Grace, is that we're not geographically in the same area because I think there's so many things we would be building together. Yeah, yeah. So that aside for the moment, tell us tell us a little bit about the First Stop Shop. Well, it's um, part of a larger idea, mm-hmm. First Stop Shop being one project under an umbrella of many worker-owned businesses. And I see Mm -hmm. the need for an umbrella organization doing that. It's really hard to get new things going in small businesses, especially because there's so much business side of it involved. Mm -hmm. And under an umbrella organization, uh, we could have an efficiency that a lot of the business part of it is handled and we, the smaller entities, plug it into it and and share the resources. Right. And a lot of times, right. the, rather the things, than like reinvent the wheel, you know. Yeah, yeah and do each. it over and over. And having been a, a business person, uh, my ex husband and I were food brokers in the natural foods industry. I know um, mm-hmm. it takes a lot of time and uh, certain skills to be 
doing all the paperwork involved the paperwork, in the business side all the accounting, of accounting, all the accounts payable. And I, I've yeah. seen and heard of some similar things going on here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, so my elevator speech that I came up with for the first stop shop, which is mm-hmm. something I'm going to talk about, I, mm-hmm. I named it this, I named it that, but... These are just things where I gave it names and words just to have something as placeholders until the we came together to create it, and it was ours. Right. right. Um, So the elevator speech is Mm. worker-owned enterprise using previously manufactured goods as our raw materials. Mm. And the name, the first stop shop, I assigned it that name because I was asking people to consider making this their first stop when they want to acquire goods. Yeah. So um, don't, don't go to the box store. And maybe you'll end up there. Maybe what you need isn't here. Yeah. But go to the first stop shop first and then see what you can find. Yeah. Right. And it, it like everything, it's not for everybody, but I sense that it has um, a potential to be a successful endeavor Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people whose values, stated values are in line with what we'd be addressing through this enterprise. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there's a lot of people looking for ways to live their values. Um, I I think one of the biggest pains for us, many of us, yeah. is feeling like our lives aren't in align with our values. Oh, yeah. yeah and then it. feeling like some of the things that we're not, um, we, we don't think are for the betterment of our societies and our planet and our universe, mm-hmm. um, that we're living in ways that contribute to the very thing we think is damaging. Right. So what what is it I as an individual can do? Well, there's ultimately, I think, the most effective things are things that we will do collectively. Right, right. But something and I can do is be very careful about how we use our resources mm-hmm. um, and using things from previously manufactured goods and... Um, Where the extraction's already happened. Yeah, right. the extraction has already happened. And so we're not increasing the amount of things that also need to be disposed of because this is an extractive, exploitative, damaging process from beginning to end. Right. And and there is no real end. End. Right. The damage um, has lasting impact. And how we dispose of these things, as we know, for instance, plastics. Yeah. Yeah. is it eight in times our the lifetimes, size of Texas? we certainly won't see yeah. them, but it's estimated many lifetimes, right? And very damaging. Um, have I lost track? Where am I? Where oh, so we were asking, what is the first stop shop? So yeah, it, it should, these raw, raw materials are previously manufactured goods, and using that as your your raw materials, air mm-hmm. quotes, um, prevents further extraction, and on the tail end, prevents uh, things from going just straight to the landfill that have more life in them. Yeah, landfills, and we see those landfills um, disproportionately Mm -hmm. impact people that have the least power and and least resources to protect themselves. So So the landfills and the incinerators Mm -hmm. are in... They're almost by definition in marginalized communities. Yeah. Right. One of my favorite bumper sticker slogans, and I have this bumper sticker in my car right now, is when you throw something away, where is a way? There really is no way. There just isn't. And we've been putting it out of our sight, but that's becoming harder and harder to do. Yeah. Um, China has recently banned. They're, they're not interested in taking any more of our ways. trash. Right. And some of these... You know, we look at it as like, oh, well, I can buy this and just give it away to a poor person who will benefit. But a lot of these countries are now refusing, for instance, textiles right. for a variety of reasons, including it's it's damaging their own, their own textile, textile industries. industries. And that's right. just a part of the, mm-hmm. the problem. I like the tip, of the, the tip of the iceberg yeah. is the damage to their textile industries. 
and for for me, the thing that's really um, disheartening, or not um, not just disheartening, but dismaying, the, um, disgusting. I think I'm mm-hmm. looking for disgusting. Yeah, is the way it eats away and corrodes their own culture. Yes. That, you know, you see these cute little children of the world posters and you see the little boy, the little German boy in his lederhosen and, and you see the like the the little Polish girl in her like mm-hmm. intricately woven or Ukrainian with this embroidery and and so on. Right. So it, are children in Latin America and Africa actually dressed in like cast off net Nike? That's their traditional dress is cast off Nike clothing mm-hmm. and or cast off uh, whatever that Americans threw away. That's not their traditional dress. That's not what they run around in. And it just really, it contributes to the erasure of these cultural identities. I, and that's mm-hmm. that's disgusting. And as yeah. I think of that, it, it may not even be the most appropriate attire for adapting to their environment. Precisely. Precisely. Um, so, yeah. And in, in uh, being as responsible as they see fit, they're saying, no, thank you. You can't send your trash here anymore. And that's the simplest part of it. I, I think most of us, if we stop and think about it for even a short time, realize we have a serious overproduction problem. The volume of stuff in thrift shops and yard sales and flea markets. Um, it's out of control. It, it's hard to give away and get yeah. anybody to even take it anymore. Yeah, it, it's, yeah because there's just so much. And... There's building after building after building of it. You know, I think there's a goodwill in every city, a Salvation Army in every town. And they're basically these warehouses that Mm -hmm. are full and they can't give it away, you know. So so tell me a little bit where this project is. So so you've been working on this for how long? Well, I... um... I'm always looking at the most, from my limited vision, what is the upstream? Mm -hmm. Um, Trying, aware of problems Mm -hmm. and a lot of what we're called to, or what we see as activism is is dealing with the end results Results. of these problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, you know, isn't there something we can do before we get to that point that's going to be more effective because right. it, it just doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere. So I've been looking um, more upstream and it seemed to me as I did this analysis in so many different areas where I see we need to do things differently mm-hmm. that this was an upstream of many different things, whether it's environmental Mm-hmm. Justice issues, mm-hmm. uh, damaging the environment, like blowing mountain tops off, right, mountain top uh, and the um, child Pop, labor, child labor, destroying others' cultures mm-hmm. and means t- to uh, ha- destabilizing their own systems that had been working. Have been working, yeah. Oh, and don't let's not forget um, jobs with dignity. Yes. Yeah. I mean, many layers here, many layers. Yeah. yeah. And then at this end, um, living wage jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why the worker-owned enterprise. Mm-hmm. We One of the ways the Occupy movement was very successful is it's given us a common language and greater awareness of the disparity of Mm -hmm. resources and we talk about the one percent and we know what we're talking about well this has all been a tool of that extraction of resources to the one percent whether it's our labor all of it whatever it might be yeah Mm -hmm. so i i know in michigan um we our municipalities Mm -hmm. have been uh, robbed of the ability to of local rule like we cannot establish higher minimum wages than the state does we can't have rent control right so so this so and to be clear just to clarify mm -hmm. a little bit so let's say the city of detroit wants to establish a higher local minimum wage the state constitution forbids that correct 
And let's say you want to have some kind of so okay, maybe the state of Michigan. Yeah, I'm won't not sure do if this. it's constitution, but it's they've put it into some kind of law that municipalities right. can. Do. A, and actually, they can't you know, ban I, plastic bags. You can't ban plastic bags as a municipality. <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to do it. Um, so and you know what? You're right. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's not constitutional. It is legislative. Mm-hmm. So we can over we could potentially overturn it, mm-hmm. but that's the thing. It bars us from taking action in our local community. Mm -hmm. And to make any change of that bar, we have to function at the state level, which for many people, unless you have the money to like physically Mm -hmm. get to Lansing and lobby, Mm -hmm. and unless you have the influence to get the ear Mm -hmm. of folks in Lansing, you really... That's out of the loop for you. Yeah, and it's going to take time and changing the system. And I hope there are people who are working on it and that they are effective but, but I think we yeah. need to be looking at many different things going on mm-hmm. well, while we all even, stay connected. This and doesn't this even include the emergency manager law, which is separate and distinct from yes. this. Yes, and Hamtramck, Highland Park, Detroit, mm-hmm. of course, Benton Harbor, Flint, plenty, many cities many have cities. been affected by these emergency managers, which is, yeah, that's yeah. a whole other outrageous thing that is... It, and it's just appalling. Mm-hmm. Actually, the, the, um, it was Ypsilanti had an emergency school manager mm-hmm. that led to this disaster. We were talking about this earlier with their um, yeah. uh, in, um, international school. Yeah, in Highland Park, I'm not sure <clears throat> if it was the city or the school that mm-hmm. came first with the emergency manager. But right. Yeah, they... right. And so, that, so Ypsilanti as a city is sort of in this shell shock mm-hmm. from the emergency manager for the public school system is now terrified of triggering an emergency manager for the city itself. And like everything they do, they're thinking, and that's why they're, it's sort of ripe for these mm-hmm. scandals that you see. People are terrified of triggering the emergency manager because we saw how it played out mm-hmm. in the places. We saw how it played out in the school system. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a disaster. Yeah, so I don't know that they cannot also pass, pass legislation that would um, – eliminate or hamper our ability to do work our own collectives but it's it's something that's available to us now but yeah and right now like, that can happen in yeah. michigan we have cooperatives we have cooperative housing mm-hmm. there's uh, there's a legal infrastructure it's mm-hmm. a bit um what's the word i'm looking for it, it's it, it's kind of uh, cobbled together mm-hmm. because unlike many states we don't have any law it's so like you can form a corporation under Michigan state law. Mm-hmm. You can't form a cooperative under Michigan state law. You can form a corporation and then mm-hmm. call it a cooperative in your bylaws. Mm-hmm. And that's the most we have. But it exists and we can use it. Yeah. So yeah. And we have people doing it that we can tap into those resources to learn the best ways to deal with the system right. as it right. is. So... um yeah. Oh, so that we started it off with uh, the ways in which Michigan, um, by law, prevents municipalities from taking local mm-hmm. action. And so you, you were getting at how this is something we can do. Yeah. We can form cooperatives. And in narrowing down my passion and my work so I can mm-hmm. be somewhat effective, right. where I do... Um, put pressure on my legislators mm-hmm. in relationship to this is, first of all, showing them cities that are doing things to encourage this kind of thing and where it's right. successful and how it can benefit the cities mm-hmm. in ways that the current model Does doesn't. You know, and asking for a more level playing field because we are underwriting and incentivizing these I'm just going to use the language that Grace and I are comfortable with and understand what it means, capitalist, yeah. uh, unbridled capitalism. Mm-hmm. You know, say the Illiches and the Gil- Dan Gilberts of Detroit yes. are those projects that have, they benefit greatly from mm-hmm. are underwritten by the people of Detroit through the incentives. Right. You know, valuable properties being given over for a dollar so they can build stadiums that they will make money at. Right. So they're going to make money, but the people of Detroit are going to pay for it. So one of the things that's most infuriating to me is when I see an article uh, that was ostensibly saying, you yeah, know, co-ops, great idea. And then the, the conclusion of the author of this one that it comes to mind is saying, yeah, but if it's such a great idea, why aren't they, haven't 
there have been more of them and why aren't they more exce- successful? It's because they we don't have a level playing ground. Yeah, they yeah. have not been... It's like credit unions, that we don't have a level playing ground. Yes. So um, I will and do put pressure on my legislators... To, to make it more level. Yeah, to realize that this is a benefit for the our areas mm-hmm. and that it needs to be given a chance by being incentivized. And there's places like Madison, Wisconsin, and New mm-hmm. York City that mm-hmm. are doing this. Yeah. They yeah. realize that this is something that's going to benefit their city. It's a way they can get around some of the handcuffs that were put on by the states and federal mm-hmm. limitations put on us. The money stays more locally. Yes. Um, the, it's... It's an all-around win. Even mm-hmm. for capitalists, mm-hmm. it's a win. Except what I think a lot of capitalists don't like to admit about themselves is they like capitalism for them, mm-hmm. right? Or like rather, they like socialism for them and capitalism for the rest of us, yeah. right? Or That's one way I've heard it put. But they really like it when they're the only capitalist in town and they run mm-hmm. the show. Mm-hmm. They don't actually like free competition because that means... You can, effectively, you have to share. <laughs> yeah, and that that stems from something that I know you and I share, Grace. Is uh, mm-hmm. the only way I can understand that is that people that favor that type of capitalism or, mm-hmm. or economic model mm-hmm. don't see the connection that ultimately right. they cannot continue benefiting, and certainly oh. future generations. So if they do care about their children and their grandchildren. They're harming them. Yeah, this is an act of harm to your grandchildren, mm-hmm. and and sort of. And I, I, we were talking about, or touching on this earlier, when we were talking about like monarchy and and hierarchy and so on. Mm-hmm. That there used to be a disposition of understanding that if I create this harm in the long term, it's only going to come back to bite me. Mm-hmm. And we took a lot of those checks out of the system. So people can actually kind of convince themselves that making a billion dollars today at everyone's expense is somehow better than making a million dollars over the next 10 years and maybe doing things a little more equitably, Mm -hmm. right? Because honestly, I think in this, in the world we've come into, first of all, back up all the way, I'm talking about making this money or making that money. I just need to remind people that money is not real. You can't mm-hmm. eat it. But let's just pretend that money is a thing. Because the shared delusion like of money. Do. Like we do. <laughs> like we do. We have this shared delusion. Uh-huh. We print it in every time. And the shared delusion has real impacts on our lives. Mm-hmm. So let's pretend money is a thing and you need to make it. We're not talking about saying um, these billionaires don't have nice homes anymore. We're talking about no children starving. The people with nice mm-hmm. things will still have nice things. Mm-hmm. Right? We're talking about children not starving. And I think that's the reality that a lot of people don't grasp. That the orders of magnitude, the billions and trillions of dollars that individuals have, is enough money for that individual to be just as comfortable as they are right now. Give the rest of it away mm-hmm. and children don't starve elderly people don't wonder where their next meal is coming from. Yeah, because these resources that they've hoarded Mm -hmm. um, aren't being utilized anyway. They're not being used. You can only use so much. Right, you can only eat so well. You can only live in so many houses at the same time. And beyond that, you're just hoarding. And that hoarding harms people. So this is kind of really just about stopping the hoarding, you know? Mm -hmm. So... um, I think what's really genius about this umbrella of worker-owned cooperatives is it takes effectively the system's waste mm-hmm. and diverts the system's um, exploitation into meaningful jobs mm-hmm. and our needs, our actual needs being met. I actually, I need a new coat. So we're going to divert some of the waste. We're going to meet the needs of people who have needs and jobs and in the career Mm -hmm. and then give someone the coat that they need Mm -hmm. and rather than find some new um social benefit method you know corporation where you go to a uh, an impoverished village and turn it into making coats for i don't know who and i don't know how uh, 
and using more extractive technology on the same model. It kind of it basically subverts the system. That mm-hmm. that's what's always made me giddy. Mm-hmm. Is the way that this subverts the system and kind of effectively yeah. uses the system against itself. Well, the Facebook group I set up for mm-hmm. this it's first stop shop right boycott the, the system. system. So I use a massive boycott because these short term boycotts are. are Token. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, like the, right now we're supposed to be doing boycotting Nestle. You know, I've been boycotting Nestle for more than thirty years. Yes, they're still doing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like this massive boycott of the system is is kind of the only way mm-hmm. to see how we can get our material needs met. Um, sort of diverting things from mm-hmm. the system to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um. So what what are the barriers you faced here to get getting forward, moving forward and getting uh, off the ground? Number one is people. People. It, it's not an I, it's a we. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, I've had, it, at least in the earlier stages, mm-hmm. people saying great idea, but n- not people willing to step out of their current lives and um, let's do it. Let's do it, yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. when I say early stages, I think it's that um, I haven't enlarged my circle enough that I have new voice, new ears to hear mm-hmm. what I have to say. Um, and people are tired of hearing the same old tune from me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wait, which so, which happens. Yeah, yeah. So I've exhausted that. And, you keep playing your record, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, why keep talking about it at all? Well, I kind of can't not. It's can't in not. me. Mm-hmm. And I still hope to plant some seeds. I mm-hmm. uh, am in the process, I hope, mm-hmm. of dispersing. I I took it beyond words and telling people because I think people couldn't get it. And I thought that if I, uh, if I build it, they will come. Right, right. And I did get a... S- s- what felt to, seemed to me like a significant level of encouragement mm-hmm. for it. Um, so, but I, I'm not a person that carry can c- continue care to carry it. I'm a I don't have the resources mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I can maintain Just keep it going life for myself, let right. alone that. Mm-hmm. Um, that I've planted enough seeds that'll take. Take root somewhere, take sometime. Yeah. The frustration is, if not now, when? Man. Do we wait? Um, I mean, how desperate do we have to be? Yeah, to, I, to take this off the ground. Right? I got clear in my life fifteen some years ago now that my role in this was building a new model. Mm-hmm. You know, there's people who were tearing down the old unjust ways. Yeah, that my we need to have some things that we're building in the meantime, and I really like the Buckminster Fuller quote, uh, you don't change things by eliminating the old model, you build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. Obsolete, yeah. And mm-hmm. so I try to do that, and it's not new with me. I didn't invent right. these ideas. I may hone it Mm-hmm. put it together in a different way, mm-hmm. um, see that if many of us are doing this, we're building a web of a new way. Yeah, um, yeah. And there's places where they do repair cafes. Yeah, I love this. There's, I think, in the Netherlands, a whole mall mm-hmm. of businesses that are repurposed goods. Right. And whether it's just cleaning up a wonderful, functional item and showing people how it's useful right. or taking it apart, mm-hmm. smelting it down. I mean, we do that with metal and well, it's can... possible to do it with glass mm-hmm. and some things. Yeah. Um, one of the, thing, the impediments to that kind of thing is we've been told it's cheaper to replace it than oh, to yeah, fix it. But cheaper. we're looking at a very small piece. The bigger picture is it is not cheaper. Nope. It's costing. Mm -hmm. And we have been sold a bill of goods about free and cheap. Yes. But our free and our inexpensive is paid for by somebody else. And also cheap manifests in very poor quality goods 
mm-hmm. that don't last. Right. And one of the reasons some of these previously manufactured goods, one should covet them, mm-hmm. is that things were, many things were made of a higher quality at a time when corporations didn't insist on such high return every single quarter. Every quarter. Right. And people didn't insist, hadn't become addicted to having large volumes of very inexpensive Things. stuff. Large volumes of very inexpensive stuff and, and new every season. Yes. So it's fall, That's time for That's been around for a while, though. And the yeah. auto industry and the fashion industry ah, the have Vanguard. been big contributors to right. our be- believing that. Right. Very but damaging. The, the sort of, and it's, not, it's beyond planned obsolescence mm-hmm. into this sensation that your coat, your shoes, your car... Mm-hmm. It only needs to be new. Like, it has to be the appropriate style. It has to be, um, and look new and not mm. worn in any way. Whereas, like, you know, my favorite shoes are well-worn. My favorite coat is well-worn, right? But no, no, no. We don't do that. We don't yeah. play that. And one of the impediments to mm-hmm. what you were asking about that is that we have a culture that doesn't appreciate Old, old people, old wisdom. Yes. There's yes. Um, a patina and a beauty. You know, the, there's the Japanese term wabi-sabi. Mm-hmm. It's become kind of trendy too. But right. it's an appreciation for how things age. And, you know, we mm-hmm. have this, uh, some people are aware of a pottery technique mm-hmm. where broken pottery is put together mm-hmm. with gold. So it's gold veins. And, right. and so And it highlights the yes. quote damage yes as part of its beauty yeah. so it may require us to create a new te- um sensibility a new taste for something mm-hmm. you know things are an acquired taste well right. guess what we were sold told that this mm-hmm. is what's beautiful just like we talk about the white features being beautiful versus other cultures this is all acquired we can if we really understand and um the cost of the tastes we've allowed ourselves to acquire Mm -hmm. we can redirect that right i mean and especially especially the people who claim to value doing so Mm -hmm. i mean there's folks who you know they like their suburban tract house. Mm. They like the way it looks. They like it. They don't have any value conflict for themselves. I'm actually not talking to them. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't care for them or think someone needs to talk to them. I, I think there's a different conversation to have with them. Mm-hmm. But for the folks who seem to express this as a value, mm-hmm. I think that means you need to do something different. And Although I think yeah. there's people living in those places that share these values too you know yes yes there's pros and cons and there's reasons reasons the suburban layout Mm -hmm. is appealing right some people no i have lived in the city Mm. my entire life i've lived always lived with a sidewalk and a city garden Mm -hmm. and um this is actually the first time in my adult life i've been further than walking distance from church Mm. very first time I've always lived within blocks of mm. our church um, and the decision to move here was driven by some things that weren't necessarily internal right so here I am in a place I wouldn't normally so I, I'm not I don't mean to shame people for mm-hmm. living where they live and doing what they do exactly mm-hmm. but there are folks whose values are not aligned with what we're talking yes. about yeah and you know that's okay that's a different conversation. Yeah, and that's been a pushback. Well, people won't. Well, some people won't. Some and people will. We have to start somewhere. With the people who somehow. want this, yeah. right? Who who claim to want this. Yeah, and one of the current trends that, I'm not sure, dismay isn't quite the word. It, mm-hmm. Actually, it kind of pisses me off, is this mm-hmm. simplicity movement. Oh, yes. <laughs> which is... <laughs> which I... Honestly, it's yeah. more of an aesthetic thing. And then so people are thing, going then. to throw away their functional things and go out and buy new, often poor quality things mm-hmm. so they can have this look of simplicity. simplicity. And then we're guilted into, you mm-hmm. know, told that, well, clutter makes you depressed and stuff. And, and this is lack of clutter. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's an in-between. And you're talking about I not Mm -hmm. we and the impact on other people. Because I do believe that people of privilege have 
greatly benefited from this system that is. So people mm -hmm. of privilege, whatever your level of privilege is, mm -hmm. have a greater responsibility to deal with the consequences right, of it. Right. And I don't think it's going to be all painful. You know, there's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, this idea that this simplistic or minimalist mm -hmm. aesthetic is somehow ideal. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it's an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Simplicity, you know, simplicity's been around a long time. Who was it? It was I, I'm going to forget. I'm going to uh, forget who to attribute the quote to. You know, you need to live simply so that others can simply live. Mm -hmm. That's been with us a very long time, and long enough that we didn't have the obscene abundance of stuff abundance of that stuff. we have now. Right. Somehow, right. not that we haven't been overproducing for some time now, but it, mm -hmm. it really ramped up. I, I haven't done the ago. numbers to see when and where and when how. When it took off, but yeah. But yeah. it's a different thing. And one of the things that um, got things a little clearer, his influence, my thinking, was a essay by Joan Chittister, which was published mm -hmm. in her book, The Heart of the Temple, on simplicity. Mm-hmm. And she talks about this being a complex world, so wanting simplicity isn't necessarily realistic. Yeah. And oftentimes when we strive for this simplicity, whether it's in relationships where we, we just say, I don't want anything to do with conflict, I'm not going to clutter my life with, with conflict. conflict, or whether it's stuff, or, or we're oftentimes pushing that off on other people. And right. that... That's privilege that yeah. allows you to do it. Right. So when you get rid of the stuff, who's bearing the cost? The cost of, of you getting, getting rid of it. And, and some of the principles behind it, you know, in Kanmari, well, if it doesn't bring you joy, again, this is very I. I very keep I. hearing the I, I, I. Right. But well, if you can replace it for no more than twenty dollars, I don't, I don't want, know what their number is. Mm -hmm. Heck with it. You know that you can raise it. Well, not everybody can. Number can one, and you're it. still contributing to that consumer consumerism. Yeah. Oh, excess consumption and production mm -hmm. model, and not everybody has, you know, say, so I'm going to share, share. And I've tried setting up sharing networks, which is something I do support. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to do that well, too, we need to make sure that we're all bearing the burden of it. You know, people don't mind borrowing things from me, but they also don't mind criticizing me for having so much stuff. stuff. Mm, mm. Something's not fitting here, yeah. you know. I, know. I want... You know, at Can't some point to have smaller houses but have a large community house where the shared things are, which is built into some co-housing things. Yeah. But we need to find ways to do this. That, not, that everyone has access to. Yes. Because that's the co-housing problem. It's, yes. it's, it's a playground for rich white people. Right, yes. You know? And... Um, that doesn't solve the problem. Yeah, so we can, you know, co-housing's interesting to look yeah. at, but and it's stolen or taken its cues from the way community, some of the things community used to be, right. and put them in a, another model. In another, another gated, gated community model. Yeah. Right. It's and the gate is to all. the gate is money. So increasing the commons, libraries, and and there are libraries that are lending more than just books. Right. But using right. The, the library model mm -hmm. that we all contribute to, mm -hmm. and we can all benefit share. from. Yeah. So and then that's the thing, when there's an individual who takes on this community role and provides a cooperative common space mm -hmm. of stuff and things and, and resources, mm -hmm. it becomes like, huh, why do you have all this stuff? Huh, what are you doing? That's not very, you know, minimalist or whatever the aesthetic of the mm -hmm. moment is. Yeah. Um, and, and to be clear, I sort of embrace a minimalist aesthetic. It's I love like, it. Yeah, I like it. I like the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But this thing as like a, a cultural movement is perverse, you know? And... Um, I actually, at this point, because I've mm -hmm. been carrying this and I'm not the healthiest mindset about it right now, mm -hmm. resent having to carry so to carry much this. of this. Right, right. And then it turns into, oh, look at you not being minimalist. But didn't you also just get something out of her not being a minimalist? I'm just asking, <laughs> right? People benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I. There are things at the first stop shop that people want to buy and they can get them there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but that's only possible because you've made that possible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's been underwritten by me. Underwritten by you. And similarly... In a big way. They don't say, yeah, they don't say, well, what's up with J.C. Penney hoarding all this stuff? No one says that. Yeah. Why do they have this weird... They understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. That they want those items, and this is a place where they can go get them, and they go get them there, right? Um, I think people really have a lot of... Uh, sort of um, not the system trains us to view corporations as good and individuals mm -hmm. and collective action as bad and to be suspicious of it and to criticize it because it is that yeah and, and it, right I found it really interesting this last couple of years um, in the pharmaceutical industry world mm -hmm. um, is it the fellow that did the EpiPen oh yeah and yeah. I, I don't remember his name but he's a Kind of a smarmy guy. Yeah. yeah. So we have one person and we can pin it on and we hate him. Why are we, we hate not him. saying it about the corporations that do the same thing? Yeah. Curious that. That this, this, this individual is a bad guy. Yeah. We're not talking about how the pharmaceutical industry is grotesque. Yeah. And does a lot of harm as an industry. Mm hmm that's not a conversation we're willing to have, but we're willing to ex excoriate this guy. Mm -hmm. And really, he, he's kind of a smarmy guy. Yeah, he, he's easy to dislike. He's easy to dislike, but we're going to excoriate him, no, but Mr. never Rogers. evaluate the the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Not in any critical way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always just kind of mysterious to me. Like, you, didn't, you don't see how those connected? But we don't sometimes. We really don't. Mm -hmm. So so moving forward, so like, what, what do you see going forward? What's in, in the... Where, where do you want to take this going from here? Well, um, like I said, I hope it takes root somewhere, somehow, and I'm sure it is. Yeah. I, I don't think this right. is unique. Um, and I'm just at this point in my life kind of <laughs> sadly burnt out on it and, and needing to move on and see mm -hmm. what next. What next? Um, going through the very laborious and I anticipate painful process mm. of dispersing these goods and hoping they don't wind up in landfills. And, right. Uh, one of the roots of this, and I realize how it um, it's deep in me and not just this thing, is I mm. like to see things well used. Yes. In the best sense of the word. Right, um, best sense of well used. Right. And that's people and our gifts. Mm-hmm goods mm -hmm. and, and and they're intertwined too right. we are not using people's gifts well by um they continuing keep... to ex extract unnecessary labor to uh, to create more unnecessary goods, goods. when we have to a lot of goods out. We have a lot of goods. And really the only reason we're doing that is to extract wealth, to yes. send them in one direction. Yes. It's been this is how they created a system that could extract wealth. And and then pump it towards the wealthiest people, yes. people who are already, already mm -hmm. wealthy. Yeah, and if you want to, you know, people come up with to almost ridiculous arguments to right. it, you know, well, you know, the... If it was if co-ops were so great, why aren't there more of them? Well, we have you legislation know. preventing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and well, poor people are better off now than they were a hundred years ago. Oh, really? Well, it's uh, all what, about having what, a microwave. Is one it? of those ridiculous, in my view, arguments was, well, what when we run out of stuff. You know, we're a long ways, and we'll just deal with it. We'll just deal we with it. I mean, right. that's ideally what life is. We're changing, and Adapting. in the um, software development, they have the terms agile and mm -hmm. lean, which mm -hmm. mean it's it's just kind of common sense. Yeah. You look at it as you go. You do it simple to start with. You tweak it as you go along, right. and you deal with things as they come. You know, But that's marvelous, though. What are you going to do when you run out of stuff? Well... Well, the, I see us applying a just-in-time model, oh. which they've done in manufacturing, where instead of backlogging um, all the parts, mm -hmm. we fine-tune our system so we are only ordering and manufacturing the parts to things as we, we need, need them. them, and to try to predict what we're going to need right. in the future 
mm-hmm. in a fast-changing world is kind of ridiculous anyway. And I'm also hoping, I'm really hoping that one of the things that grows from this, these planted seeds, is something that shifts our full understanding of what it is we actually need, mm-hmm. right? Yes. That you don't need some new dealy bopper from the dollar store. Mm-hmm. You just you actually don't need that, but you know your washing machine. Your washing machine has a broken part. Yeah, maybe you need that. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't. Yeah, maybe you don't. Maybe. Mm-hmm. And I use a washing machine. Full disclosure: I use a washing machine and a dryer. Mm-hmm. Many days of the year, I've got my drying rack, but I don't use it on in ice storms. <laughs> so, um, but maybe you don't need that washer. Maybe you do. Maybe you mm-hmm. need something with. Um, more appropriate technology. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see our technology and our manufactured goods go the route of needed and wanted items rather than items looking for someone to buy them. Yes. Because right now we have a whole economy of problems looking, or probably solutions looking for problems Mm -hmm. and goods looking for someone to buy them. Yes. Rather than people looking for goods and people solving their own problem. Yeah, and culture shifting is a big part of this. Yeah. Uh, just to create an understanding of why you should be inconvenienced, because right now it's going to seem inconvenient as it gets going, because it's more convenient to have a 24 hour mire and go there, whatever you want, and have things displayed. Lined up on the shelves. But mm-hmm. one of the things about these being small co-op entities that are fully transparent is we start to really understand everything that goes into it. And right. we can start questioning, hmm. how can Meyer pay these bills for the lights and the shelves and the staff and, yeah. and, and me still get this thing for dirt, dirt cheap? cheap. At three in the morning. Mm, yeah. Uh, so we start connecting more with the reality of this system that we've created that yeah. just can't keep going on this way. Can't. Not if we um, want to reduce rather than increase the suffering in the world. Yeah. As um, we have the ability to have the information Mm-hmm. about what's happening. It's not hidden to us. How many of us aren't in pain from coming to the greater and greater realization mm-hmm. of we come to, at some point, get to the real understanding that I have somehow participated in this. Yes, that I've done I'm this. I'm complicit or I'm participating in it. Mm-hmm. How and do I, feel, I not participate? I'd rather not participate. And I feel like some of these like arguments, so, huh, what are you going to do when you run out of stuff, is... Some people's answer to that cognitive dissonance where they're like, I've been a part of this. Mm-hmm. They, it's much more important to point out why nothing else was possible rather than embrace that they've been a part of something really destructive. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's painful to, to embrace that, but I think that's the first step to doing something different. You know? Mm-hmm. So um, any, any last thoughts? Um, I wish everyone well, and I hope that you're on the journey um, to greater love and openness and acceptance and belief that it can be different and that we are, um, we have a role in in the change that can come, that is possible. It's possible. Yeah. Amen. All right. I think uh, Paul's probably going to read an outro, and I think that'll be a wrap. Okay. Thank you, Grace. Thanks, Joy. All righty. Take care. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube.